Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this week's study, to this to morning studies. Uh, before we begin, can we open with a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are, are grateful for the time that we have once again to study your word and um, to understand the light for this time. Uh, we pray for your presence that you can uh, teach us and direct us in our studies. We ask that your Holy Spirit can impress our hearts and minds and that you can give us strength uh, to live a Christian life and to reveal your character to others. We ask for your Spirit's presence in this study. And for those that are watching online as well, we pray, Lord, that uh, you can lead and guide them into all truth. Be with us now as we study together in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, good morning. Stephen and I had just a little discussion before this study regarding the death decree, where it is, and the plagues. And uh, at some point, we're going to have to come back to that on, on some study, not in this one particularly. But um, there are things that, you know, when we study, you know, we can start down a line of thinking. So, you know, maybe in my mind, there's a line of thinking that I have that I have to re-examine. And so it's, it's important to look at things with an open mind. I was watching a video about uh, different, um, different characteristics of psychology and how we perceive the world around us. And, you know, the, the it's kind of interesting how our brain works, how we make decisions. And sometimes when it comes to studying truth, you know, we get caught in in a, a, a trap, what they call cognitive bias. You know, we look for things that support a view that we have. One of the things that we've done in our study is we've wanted to, to be open to God to be corrected. And it's not an easy thing sometimes to do, right, because we, we have – bunch of things that are all related that we believe. So when it comes to uh, changing our mind about some issues, sometimes opposition can actually even harden us further in in our views and opinions. So I think it's always important that we, we take the time to look at things. Um, now, here in this study, uh, we've been going through, you know, him that honors me shall I honor and reading a bunch of spirit of prophecy quotes. Uh, so that's first Samuel two, verse three, them that honor me will I honor. And we know that uh, there's, there's lots of examples uh, in Ellen White's writings of people that she wrote to that she presented the scripture. John Harvey Kellogg is one of them. And, and we can see that just because somebody has been blessed uh, with light, if that person doesn't continue in that path, you know, God can remove from him uh, the wisdom that he gave him. And so we have to be really careful in our own lives that just because God has worked in our lives at this point, uh, using us to spread his truth, uh, sometimes, and we're going to see this with Saul, of course, that just because somebody's put in a position, it doesn't mean that uh, he's always going to be right. And so there's, there's lots to learn from this. Okay, so this is from eight testimonies. And I skipped through some of this here uh, on my own and moved through some of this. But here we're going to read this one from eight testimonies, 123.2. Remember that your experience is not the first of the kind. You know the history of Joseph and of Daniel. The Lord did not prevent the plottings of wicked men, but he caused their devices to work for good to those who admits trial and conflict, preserve their faith and loyalty. And one of the greatest blessings that we can have is trial. Why is that? Because it allows us to overcome our inherited and cultivated tendencies. Yeah. It, it causes us to turn to God. If, if everything went the way that we expected, we would think of ourselves as better than we really are. Um, the far, furnace fires are not to destroy, but to refine, ennoble, sanctify. Without trial, 
We should not feel so much our need of God and his help, and we should become proud and self-sufficient. In the trials that come to you, I see evidence that the Lord's eye is upon you and that he means to draw you to himself. It is not the whole, but the wounded who need a physician. It is those who are pressed almost beyond the point of endurance who need a helper. Turn to the stronghold, learn the precious lesson. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Which is one of my favorite scriptures. Humanity, humanity may be exalted by the world for what it has done, but man can lower himself very fast in God's sight by misapplying and misappropriating his entrusted talents, which if rightly used would elevate him. Well, the Lord is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. He will by no means clear the guilty, but all take heed of the words of the Lord. Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded my in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that, Thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me will I honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Uh, God honors those who obey him. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, said David. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And I did put alway his statutes from me. And I did not put his alway away his statutes from me. There we go. <laughs> so, you know, we, we need to rejoice in the trials that God has given us. And, and those trials can sometimes be extremely overwhelming. Prophecy tells us, so this is from counsels to teachers, I think. A prophecy tells us that we, as that we, that we are near the close of time. Intellectual power, natural abilities, supposed excellent judgment will not prepare the youth to become missionaries for God. No one who is seeking an education for the work and service of God will be made more complete in Jesus Christ by receiving the supposed finishing touch at in, in either literary or medical lines. I'm not sure which school she is referring to. Many have been unfitted to do missionary work by attending such schools. They have dishonored God by leaving him on one side and accepting man as their helper. Right. And of course, for Samuel 2, verse 30. And this next part here, which I think is really important, God's word should be received as the foundation and finisher of our faith. It is to be received with the understanding and with the whole heart. It is life and is to be incorporated into our very existence. Thus received, the word of God will humble man at the footstool of mercy and separate him from every corrupting influence. So when, when we come and study God's word, it is to be worked upon by God, to be recreated into his image, just as he spoke the world into existence. In the year that King Uzziah died, said Isaiah, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each one had six wings, with twain did he cover his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him they cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Beholding this grand and glorious representation, the prophet discerned his own imperfections and those of the people with whom he dwelt. Woe is me, he cried, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 6, 1 to 5. Oh, how many who have engaged in this work of responsibility need to behold God as did Isaiah. For in the presence of his glory and majesty, self will sink into nothingness. And uh, 
written from Melbourne, Australia, February 10th, 1894, for the teachers of Battle Creek College. So here's just some things about education, basically, that what we really need is an understanding of God's word. We need God's word to work upon us and that we need to uh, have a life of self-denial, right? That so often the education of the world is basically to train us to have a life of leisure, right? And, and it's understandable from human nature. Okay. Isaiah's experience represents last day church trials and apparent failure. Okay. What is that link there, Kelly? You, you shared a link to something. Who is that? Is it's it the to one of uh, Kelly's present presentations. Oh, oh, that was your presentation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Back when, when I was uh, in Australia. Okay, so that's uh, May 24th of this year. Kelly did a presentation dealing with Isaiah, so he just gave us that link. Then you have the MOLAD interval link. Okay, I'm not sure why. Okay, so now we're going to start looking at uh, further in First Samuel chapter 2. A any thoughts about all of those things that we had been looking at and reading about? honoring God. I mean, it's going to be very relevant as we look at Saul, David, and Solomon. So this message continues to Eli. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. Okay. So what is this verse about? It's ad addressing the destruction that's going to come upon the house of Eli. Okay. And his sons. Yeah. So we're going to have. So so we do have and, some. And it, don't, it, don't it also include Israel? Because they, they was fighting a battle and he lost it. Right? Well, well, yeah. Yeah. But it's not addressing Israel. It's addressing Eli's house. The, the situation here, the, the symbolic situation is here is leadership. Here yeah. is Eli, who had been given a very special and prominent place within Israel. And Eli had not done the work that he should have done as a parent when he found and was made to understand how corrupt his sons had been. Yeah, and... Um... In Zechariah eleven seventeen, it says, uh, Woe unto the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. And I, I just thought that was interesting. I just have a link to it because, of course, eleven seventeen is uh, the 187th prime number and 11 times 17 is 187. So, um, so that's kind of interesting, that link that I have here. So this cutting off of the arm, what is that? So we, we know it has to do with leadership, but how would we apply that to, to our situation? The right arm? Well, arm really means like, like, um, you know, symbolizes military power or strength. That uh, doesn't say right arm, just says thine arm. Okay. Thine arm. Perhaps it's to remind us of Jeremiah 17.5, seven, where, where people are cursed for leaning on the arm of flesh. Okay. Yeah. And that was Jeremiah, what, 17.10? I think it's 17.5. Well, 17.5. Okay, yeah. Thus saith the Lord God, cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. But, you know, how would we apply this if we're going to, I mean, we could obviously zoom out, you know, to the Seventh-day Adventist church. And we would say that in rejecting this message that they basically have, that, that they're going to be replaced, 
right? Not not that the Seventh Day Adventist Church, uh, you know, is no longer, you know, God's denominate people Seventh Day Adventists, but just the organization of the leadership, right? So in Eli being removed, it doesn't it doesn't affect Israel in the sense that you know Israel is still God's people. He's not casting off Israel. It just has to do with this particular leadership at this time. So when we've when we've applied this to zooming out a bit instead of from our movement itself, we're going to see, especially as we get through, you know, the glory is departed, that this is really a prophecy about what's going to happen as far as the message is concerned, that it's it, that the, the prophetic message isn't going to be proclaimed by the Seventh Day Adventist Church, that it's been bypassed. And and that's really understandable from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Like the idea that the church has, that many people have about the church, is that the organizational church is going to be reformed so that it is our ministers who are connected with God in giving the message. And I just don't find that in the spirit of prophecy. I don't know if any of you find it in there, but I have not been able to really find that that idea that it's going to be the lay people that end up doing the work and and not oh, that, yeah that it's not going to be you know the organized work so to speak that's going to complete the work that that's pretty clear in the spirit of prophecy and yet there it's is still pretty this- clear in the way they act. Sorry, it's pretty clear in the way they act. Too. I mean, I can't even step foot yeah. in those churches now. It's just seeing yeah. seeing the declension in spirituality. It's just sickening. Yeah, but but people people still within Adventism uh, often feel that well, even though the church is in bad shape, it's it's going to be reformed. The leadership will be reformed. You know that somehow we need an intact organization in order to accomplish that work in the last days. And Eloi says it'll be evident that the Lord has taken the work into his own hands, that it's not going to be man's machinery that's going to complete the work. So so there's this kind of, I mean, it's almost like a contradiction in some ways, where Eloi talks about the work of the church and and, and so forth, uh, the publishing work and, uh, you know, the Sabbath school and all these different different institutions of the church that is supposed to do a work. But yet when she gets to the end of time in her in her projection of, of events, it's pretty clear that it's not going to be those institutions that complete the work. And and people have a hard time sort of differentiating that. So how is it that we have, you know, Ellen White encourages, you know, the institutions of the church in her day. But yet when she deals with the events at the end of time, she she moves that to away from the institutions of the church. How do people how do how would you address that? Why is it that way? In the same way that she spoke highly of El the ground uh, and was repealed. Okay, so ground must be too. Is that what you said? Little little scrambled. What's that? You you, you just like a little Battle yeah. Creek. It was like Battle Creek when it you know eventually it lost God's favor. Mm-hmm. So the institution. Right. Okay, so so I mean there there was a role for the Seventh Day Adventist Church as an organization even in its time of apostasy and departing from the truth up until 1989, right? I mean, Ellen White wrote counsels to to the church, to its institutions, because that's what existed. And she couldn't just skip all of that and go right to the end, right? She, those institutions still existed, just as ancient Israel still existed. And God labored with ancient Israel. But at some point, you know, I, I the, think the kingship been... was removed. What's that, Kelly? I think it's important that God is not calling people of the denominated church, the the organized body. He's calling well that 
there's to be a shaking, and they will go out from among us, the ones that rise up against the third angel's message. Yeah, the straight testimony of the council. Of the so the, right, the straight, yeah, the straight testimony. They'll rise up against it and go out from among us. Mm-hmm. And that the, the ones that are, are scattered will be gathered and complete the work, but they will be Seventh-day Adventists. Right. Yeah. yeah. We are Seventh day Adventists, not some new church or, you know, new name as, you know, Tavo and Parminder wanted. Um, you know, they had this idea we'd form this new church and call people out of the Seventh day Adventist church into this new church and just wasn't supported in the spirit of prophecy at all. That, that also seems to be a sentiment in the American and the Canadian. I don't what? know, not to form a new organization. Not to f- form a new organization, but it's a, w- what we were talking about, a redefinition of work. What is the church? Well, it is, it's just the people. What would they be organized? How would they be organized? Would they have a new name? No, they're still Seventh-day Adventists. So mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know. I don't quite grasp wholly what, how, what they're saying, but it's it's like there's this um, resentment toward the church that prevents them from being in unity. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know about you know people's own personal feelings. I mean, all I know is that, and I'm just speaking from my own personal experience. Uh, I've never been a denominational Adventist. That is, you know, I believe the Seventh-day Adventist church is, you know, raised up by God. But I I don't really have connections with, you know, the conference or the general conference. It it doesn't really matter to me. Now, other people may disagree with me, but to me, it's always been the local church. That is, the people I know and that I interact with are, to me, the church, this sort of entity that exists that I, I have no real knowledge of. I don't know the people personally, you know, um, you know, I wasn't raised an Adventist. I never went to Adventist schools or Adventist colleges. So I don't really have any connection with them. And, and I don't find that I identify with Adventists culturally. So, you know, I, I find it actually I w- kind of distasteful. I, I still consider Adventism, most Adventists to be in a cult in the way that they act, they are very cult like. Um, so, yeah, you know, so for me, it is not really a resentment. Think, What's that Kelly? I think someone else was trying to talk. I, I didn't see it anyway. Anyway. Yeah, no, I, when I say denominated, I use it as the word denominated as Ellen White used it in name. It's the named, a named mm. people, a denominated people. Yeah, the okay. the corporate structure. No, I I see it's pretty pretty defunct. But uh, no, it, it, we're we're to gather. God will gather us together as a group of Seventh Day Adventists. Uh, yeah, denominated. We'll be yeah we'll yeah. I don't, Seventh I don't, Day Adventists. Yeah, because to me, it's not about whether somebody's a member of the church or not. It's what they believe that that defines them as Seventh-day Adventists. So I just find many people who claim to be Seventh-day Adventists, in my view, are not Seventh-day Adventists. That is, they, they don't believe what Adventists believe, or they don't believe in Adventism. They just They just go to an Adventist church, or they're, you know, ministers or, you know administrators in the Adventist church, but they don't really understand Adventism. And I always found that very strange. It's just they're, they're, they're loyal to the institutions, thinking that that's what makes them a Seventh-day Adventist. And to me, that's not. So, yeah. I, so I, yeah. I agree. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not that. It's... Not in name only, yeah. It, it's they believe the truth that Seventh Day Adventists hold, mm-hmm. and take name. Yeah, 
the ones that fall be yeah you're really broken up Kelly. It, it, i'm not getting i'm not getting the complaints. ones uh, sorry yeah. it's a weak signal the one is any better if i talk now that's better quite a delay hey mm -hmm. just hold on here let's see let's see is that better better yep yes. that's better yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's it's not the organized structure, the corporate structure. It's the it's the denominated by name. They will call themselves Seventh Day Adventists, and the false brethren will be shaken out and organized. The, the wheat will be organized under the name Seventh-day Adventist, whether it's a corporate structure or whatever. But the world will call us Seventh-day Adventists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They don't care about the institution. They just care about what people believe as well. Now, um, that, now we, that, we, that's what identifies me. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. It's just I want to be clear that I don't know. I, I, I have a problem with this calling the church the sister of Babylon and so on, and redefining the name church. It's just people here and there. Well, they got to be together, united in, the, in giving the message. Well, yeah. There's just so much division and argument now and dissension. Yeah, well, I have no problem with, uh, you know, I don't know. It, it, anyway, when we start to bring this down to this movement and we look at the leadership in this movement, uh, we, we've shown how this would relate to Jeff, uh, Jeff Pippinger and his his position, which, you know, and we, we talk about uh, with the Seventh-day Adventist Church when Ichabod, you know, the glory has departed um, with the ark being taken captive. That we, we mark that at 9-11, at least I do. But that is also going to apply to this movement, exactly where we would place that in this movement. Um, we haven't we haven't decided when we draw this on the line. But if we read here what Ellen White says in regard to this verse, parents have habits which not only defile their own lives, but the lives of their children, and they grow up in wickedness and corruption. Parents, you must preoccupy the garden of, of your child's heart. You must sow it with seeds of truth and piety. Fence a corner from your garden and watch, for example, the progress of vegetation. You sow no weeds and cultivate no flowers, but what will be the result in the fall? It will be full of weeds and thistles. Um, Eli was a priest, but though he was a good man, he was too easy with his children and he did not restrain his boys in their wickedness. So there's just counsel there for parents, though for all leaders, uh, we become, uh, one is we're an example to others, but uh, there needs to be a restraint as well. Exactly how we would apply this, I'm not certain, you know, to our movement. So First Samuel 2, verse 32, And thou shalt see, it, see an enemy in my habitation, in all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine, whom I shall not cut off from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes um, and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. Okay, so these, these two verses are connected with verse 31 as well. We have the, the translators give alternate translations. And thou shalt see the affliction of the tabernacle, uh, for all the wealth which God would have given Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be consume, shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart. And all the increase of thine house shall, of thine house shall die men. So, so they shall die as men. I'm not sure here in the flower of their age is the King James. Okay, anything that we see here in these verses. So thou shalt see the affliction of the tabernacle. Okay, let's deal with that. Thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation. We, 
uh, the alternate reading says tabernacle. That's a tent, right? The, an abode, a tabernacle, or a temple. Could also be a man's home, do, den, dwelling, habitation. Even the ma'on is the word in Hebrew, and it's from 5772, ona, you need to dwell, dwell together. So, um, so I think God's habitation here would refer to the tabernacle. Yeah, so I'm just thinking, Eli, when uh, when the ark was taken by the Philistines, mm -hmm. yeah, so they didn't actually go in to the tabernacle. Would be my understanding, and he was blind anyway, so he wouldn't see it. <laughs> well, yeah, but see is just it doesn't mean you have to actually see it. It's just uh, blind people can see things, right? Not really, but but in in that sense, understanding. Yeah. Yeah, or they will experience it, right? Okay, so it's not literally have to apply to see. Uh, but this is the affliction of the tabernacle is this other way. So thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, or thou shalt see the affliction of the tabernacle, right? So whether that's enemy or affliction, um, it's 6862, SAR, which means narrow, an adversary or to be afflicted, right? Um, well, I think the affliction would, to me, make more sense than the enemy. Yeah. Because it's, it's afflicted and that the ark will no longer return to it. Yeah, that's the way that I would take this here. So so we have an affliction of the tabernacle that is, that the glory is departed, right? When he says, you know, Ichabod. Right, that is the ark is taken, so that's an affliction of the tabernacle, not that there is an enemy in the habitation. Now, I'm just looking at the Hebrew here uh, as well. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I, I wouldn't have put in my in my uh, habitation as the King James did, because uh, there's not. Uh, there's nothing there. Uh, but in yes, McDonald. Yes, and what of uh, the way the sons of Eli were behaving, Ophni and uh, Phineas, the way they used to even like uh, sleep with women. Can't we see it like uh, they were creating their were, they were enemies? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Except this is talking about a judgment upon. Uh, Eli, Eli's house, and what's going to happen, not what has happened, right? Because he, he's already seen all of that behavior that's already been going on for a long time. So this is this is more a prophecy about what's going to happen. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And 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 here then it says, um, so that you'll see a, an affliction of the tabernacle. For all the wealth which God would have given Israel. So what does that mean? All the wealth which God would have given Israel. What about, what, what is, would that mean more the light that God would have given the movement? Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, if we apply it to the movement. Now, now the word wealth is actually not in the Hebrew. Right. So. I'm not sure why they put wealth there, because all we have is all, which is the whole. So of all that God would have given Israel, not necessarily wealth in and of itself. Does that make sense? So, but, you know, they, they put wealth, the translators put wealth every time. But you can see wealth is not in there. And God isn't in there either. Yeah, I was going to note that too. That God is not in there. So thou shalt see... Uh, the affliction of the tabernacle for all which would have been given uh, to Israel. I mean, sort of God is kind of implied. I mean, because that would, I would think what it's referring to, but um, yeah, it's not there in the original. So there's something that would have been given, but 
because of the affliction of the tabernacle, that's not going to be given. So any thoughts on that? Sometimes these things are hard to translate into English, yet it's not clear exactly what they mean. You know, and here given is not really the best word either. Um, I would say it's more to be for all that would be for Israel, because that's what it literally says. Because all it says in Hebrew is you got uh, all coal, uh, which uh, Asher, um, and then this word Yatab, which means to be. It could be, you know, good things, contentment could even mean, but, uh, and then to Israel. And we're going through this a bit slow, but yeah, so because it has a, the bet in front of the word all. Um, so, I mean, I would have translated it, um, a thou shalt see the affliction of the tabernacle in all that God would have given Israel or all that would be to Israel. So what, what I see here is that this affliction of the tabernacle is, is what is removed. All that would have been is removed. So, so I think that would be um, really a reference to the ark. Does that make sense? That could like, work. Yeah, it's almost like what what's inherited. What because you know if we look at the ark containing the law of God, it's it's God's covenant with Israel and all that would have come through that covenant. So with the the ark being removed from the tabernacle, right, being sent out, being captured by the Philistines, it's this affliction of the tabernacle, and it removes what was to be given to Israel, or what what was to be for Israel. So had, I mean, had they fulfilled their role, yes. That's why in the chat there I'm taking it not only it has as as it as it occurred historically, but as it applies to us, you know, each person, I mean, we have to decide, are we going to serve God or man? Are we going to let God cleanse our hearts? Are we going to be consecrated to him day by day? And man, it is a horrendous battle, but it's well worth it. And it's a battle that I'm facing day by day. I know personally I'm facing it day by day. I have to ask God to correct me day by day because that old flesh really wants to rise up. You know, and I have plenty of provocations. Yeah. And it's, so, you know, if I don't fulfill God's role for me, like, Lord, lead me day by day. Show me what I'm supposed to be learning here. I'm going to fail just as this family that, you know, that, that, we're, that we're talking about now fail. Like, we're supposed to be priests of God. How are we going to do that without being purged? Like, I was okay. fearful to fail God with the truth that I know now. Yeah. So, well, let's take a look at this a little further. So we got, we have this prophecy about what's going to happen. So this is before the ark has been taken. And so this is a prophecy about the ark being taken. Right. And, and what that, what that's going to mean for uh, the house of Eli. Okay. And we have, um, for thou shalt see the affliction of the tabernacle in all which was to be for Israel. So, so that would refer, I believe, to, to the ark itself. Because in that ark is what was to be for Israel. Now, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. That is, he's going to, uh, well, he's going to die, but also his sons are going to die, right? That's the idea. Uh, the folks cut down in their youth. Why? Because yeah. they chose to go the devil's way instead of God's way. It's very simple to see. Yeah. They okay. chose to, to to feed the flesh instead of feeding the spirit and were a horrible example to others. They stumbled others. Yeah. Now, um, so, you know, some people will apply this, you know, to what to be given having to do with the priesthood. Um, not, not really the ark itself, 
because we know that that line, and I would just deal with, there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. I think that this would be a reference to the ending of Eli's line as far as being the priests. Now that's going to be given later on to the sons of Zadok. In when Zadok is made priest instead of Abiathar, right? So it's gonna be along that line. So Samuel is not really gonna have a lineage either. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So yeah, now Samuel's role is kind of odd, right? In in that that he he becomes this prophet who's he's also a priest, right? But he's also a judge. And he's also a judge. Yeah. So, yeah, trying to sort out exactly how we would apply these things. I still haven't settled in my mind how we would apply this. So we're going to we're going to have to take a lot of time uh, as we go through this story. Exactly what role Samuel plays. But definitely Eli represents leadership. And, and that means there there is a change in leadership that is being prophesied. And and I think that's that's um, that's sort of the hard thing about you know understanding the role of the Adventist Church. Um, we can see that the Adventist Church has been passed by as an institution, but we're still Seventh Day Adventists, and and our leadership moves to Christ. But in, in the end, what we see is that Christ is our leader. He's he's organizing the work. He's taken the work into his own hands. Now, uh, the question is, why did God have an organized church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in 1863? Uh, why was it organized? Why was it a denominated uh, church? For some people, they, they, they say, well, you know, it's, it's God's church. It, it has to go to the end. But didn't the Jews say the same thing? Yes. Okay. So, but when when uh, Paul says, you know, like, but you still all Israel shall be saved, right? They that are of faith are of the seed of Abraham. We we can see that the church has continued. The the that Israel does continue, just in a way that was not because they had failed in their mission, and God has a different plan, which is part of God's plan all along. I mean, we see this all throughout history. You know, the elder shall serve the younger. It, it just continues to happen time after time in Scripture that where we think the leadership is going to come from and you know, who's going to receive the birthright, it doesn't happen. It's always the weakest, right? It It just... It's such it's such a pattern in scripture. I, I I wonder how we can be blinded to it to think that somehow this time the organized leadership is going to do everything that's right and it's going to finish the work when it never has. We we should learn these lessons from scripture that God is going to choose the weak things of the world to confound the wise. You know, Saul is not going to be the man who's going to be ultimately God's chosen, and yet that's who we continue to turn to, right? God, God chooses those that are humbled. And, and the church, the, the people who end up being in charge tend not to be able to do that. That's, that's why I don't want to be in charge, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we see it happen time and time again. And, and so, you know, all the work that Jeff done, did, you know, it's God's work. It was done. And, you know, I believe Jeff will be saved in the end, even though he's, you know, confused at the present time. You know, his wisdom has been taken from him. You know, his his work is completed. It's those that follow and, and encourage Jeff in his direction that are really the ones responsible. You know, imagine if no one had followed Jeff and everybody had just said to Jeff the truth. Don't you think things would have been quite different with Jeff? If he had had received what they were saying. Yeah, well, well, but, you know, if no one had followed Jeff, if Jeff had written the articles and nobody had paid attention and just 
you know, people had been converted and, you know, there was no one encouraging him in encouraging him in what he was doing. He might have recognized what he was doing, but people encouraged him. People wanted to have Jeff to follow and and we're not to follow man. Right? That's that's not what we're doing. We just want to do what God asks us to do individually. If we end up working. Amen. Amen. Yes. And an amen. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's all points to us. Are we going to follow God? We cannot follow man. We can't follow ourselves. It has to be, the focus entirely has to be on Christ, on his yeah. word. Yeah. And I'm so thankful when I first came, came into the church, there was, there was a pastor there that said, don't listen to what I'm saying. He said, study for yourselves. Like he really emphasized that. And he said, you are an, of infinite worth in Christ, in Christ's sight. And that impacted me so much. You know, yeah. that's really started to clarify a lot of things for me. I took it very seriously, and I still do. Yeah. Now, some people would just say that we're disorganized. You know, well, you're not organized. You're not really doing anything. But we believe that if we follow God and do the things he asks us to do individually, that he will unite that work and organize it without man being in charge. Now, some people think that's extremely naive on my part to believe that anything can be accomplished by just trusting in God. Is it naive to believe that God can take the work into his own hands? That what he really needs is just converted people to use. Not naive at all. It's very wise. Yeah, it's... He will perfect that which concerneth us. Well, he has begun a good work in us and he will perfect it. If we remain faithful, there's always that if. No wonder Satan's fighting so hard. Because yeah. I, it can't just be me that's waking, really waking up to this fact. Right. So we, we have to believe that God is working all over the world on all different groups of people within Adventism and some not even in Adventism to prepare them to depend upon him. And if he is going to unite that work to finally accomplish that work because that work cannot be accomplished by man. It has to be accomplished by man united with God, humanity and divinity combined, truly converted people working together. Now we look at ourselves, we know we're not truly converted, but that's, that's probably the first step to recognize our spiritual condition, that it's not what God wants. And there are many who don't recognize their spiritual condition. They believe that they are right, that they are all correct, and, and that the problem lies outside of them. And, and the problem lies inside of us. The only hindrance that God has is our stubborn, selfish human will. And if we yield that to God, he can use us. And it will all be to his glory, not to man's glory. And the man of thine, whom I shall not cut off from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart. Now, what does that mean? And the, the man of thine, whom I shall not cut off from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes and grieve thine heart. What is this referring to? Okay, so if we, we, we actually have to go to verse 36. It shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and shall say, put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices that I may eat a piece of bread. So his his uh, uh, progeny is going to be um, come to penury, I guess, is what's being said. Does that make sense? When you say come to penury, what do you mean? They're going to be poor. Of course. Okay. Yeah. So his children, his descendants are going to be poor. Right? But if, and they're if, not going to be in the priest's office. At least that's what I take it as. Um, going to become Laodicean. Yeah. Okay. So in, in that sense, I'm, I'm still looking at it more sort of literally. Sure. Um, right. Because 
Well, I'll read these other verses. So, um, so uh, in the King James, the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age, and this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. Now, that is generally understood uh, to be the sons of Zadok, but also it can be applied to Christ, right? And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and morsel of bread and shall say, put me, I pray thee, in one of the priest's offices that I may eat a piece of bread. Could you share it on the screen, please? The, the, the verses? Just what you're reading, yes, please. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess, I, yeah, because I was reading it from my Bible instead of from here. Okay, so we got, um, so this verse here, there's about half nine Phinehas, they both shall, they shall, in one day shall die both of them. And then I will raise up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. I'll build him a sure house and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread. And shall say, put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices. And they have here, join, I pray thee, into somewhat about the priesthood, that I may eat a piece of bread. I'm not sure. Uh, into somewhat about the priesthood, that I may eat a piece of bread. I'm not sure if that makes sense to me. So this uh, would apply to Ethelbald? On his descendants. Okay, Ichabod and his descendants. I have a, I have a comment in chat there yeah. because it does remind me of Re Revelation 3 9, where it says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Uh, mm -hmm. Like separating the true from the false, the chaff from from the wheat, right? The people that just want to be have the advantages and the outward title of the priesthood, rather than have the heart type entitlement that's from God. That's how I see this. Okay. There came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when we were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house, and did I? Choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me. And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, which, of course, would be his tabernacle, right? And honors thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And I will raise up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. Uh, God charged Eli with honoring his sons above the Lord. Eli had permitted the offering appointed by God as a blessing to Israel to be made a thing of abhorrence rather than bring his sons to shame for their impious and abominable practices. Those who follow their own inclination to blot to in blind affection for their children, indulging them in the gratification of their selfish desires and do not bring to bear the authority of God to rebuke sin and correct evil, make it manifest that they are honoring their wicked children more than they honor God. We read that statement before. They are more anxious to shield their reputation than to glorify God, more desirous to please their children than to please the Lord and to keep his service from every appearance of evil. God held Eli as a priest and judge of Israel, accountable for the moral and religious standing of his people, and in a special sense for the character of his sons. He should first have attempted to restrain evil by mild measures, but if these did not avail, he should have subdued the wrong by the severest means. 
He incurred the Lord's displeasure by not reproving sin and executing justice upon the sinner. He could not be depended upon to keep Israel pure. Those who have too little courage to reprove wrong or who through indolence or lack of interest make no earnest effort to purify the family or the church of God are held accountable for the evil that may result from their neglect of duty. We are just as responsible for evils that we might have checked in others by exercise of parental or pastoral authority as if the acts had been our own. Eli did not manage his household according to God's rules for family government. He followed his own judgment. The fond father overlooked the faults and sins of his sons in their childhood, flattering himself that after a time they would outgrow their evil tendencies. Many are now making a similar mistake. They think they know a better way of training their children than that which God has given in his word. They foster wrong tendencies in them, urging as an excuse They're too young to be punished. Wait till they become older and can be reasoned with. Thus, wrong habits are left to strengthen until they become a second nature. The children grow up without restraint, with traits of character that are a lifelong curse to them and are liable to be reproduced in others. There's no greater curse upon households than to allow the youth to have their own way. When parents regard every wish of their children and indulge them in what they know is not for their good, the children soon lose all respect for their parents all regard for the authority of God or man, and are led captive at the will of Satan. The influence of an ill-regulated family is widespread and disastrous to all society. It accumulates, accumulates in a tide of evil that affects families, communities, and governments. Uh, because of Eli's position, his influence was more extended than if he had been an ordinary man. His family life was imitated throughout Israel. The baleful results of his negligent, ease-loving ways were seen in thousands of homes that were molded by his example. If children are indulged in evil practices while the parents make a profession of religion, the truth of God is brought into reproach. The best test of the Christianity of a home is the type of character begotten by its influence. Actions speak louder than the most positive profession of godliness. If professors of religion, instead of putting forth earnest, persistent, and painstaking effort to bring up a well-ordered household as a witness to the benefits of faith in God, are lax in their government and indulgent in the evil desires of their children, they are doing as did Eli, and are bringing disgrace on the cause of Christ and ruin upon themselves and their households. But great are the evils of parental unfaithfulness under any circumstances. They are tenfold greater when they exist in the families of those appointed as teachers of the people. When these fail to control their own households, they are, by their wrong example, misleading many. Their guilt is as much greater than that of others as their position is more responsible. The promise had been made that the house of Aaron should walk before God forever, but this promise had been made on condition that they should devote themselves to the work of the sanctuary, with singleness of heart and honor God in all their ways not serving self nor following their own perverse inclinations. Eli and his sons had been tested, and the Lord had found them wholly unworthy of the exalted position of priests in his service. And God declared, be it far from me. He could not accomplish the good that he had meant to do to do them because they failed to do their part. The example of those who minister in holy things should be such as to impress the people with reverence for God and with fear to offend him. When man standing in Christ's stead... Uh, to speak to the people of God's message of mercy and reconciliation, use their sacred calling as a cloak for selfish or sensual gratification. They make themselves the most effective agents of Satan. Like Hophni and Phinehas, they cause men to abhor the offering of the Lord. They may pursue their evil course in secret for a time, but when at last their true character is exposed, the faith of the people receives a shock that often results in destroying their confidence in religion. There's left upon the mind a distrust of all who profess to teach the word of God. The message of the true servant of Christ is doubtfully received. The question constantly arises, will not this man prove to be like the one who we thought so holy and found so corrupt? Thus the word of God loses its power upon the souls of men. Okay, so she doesn't go into any detail about some of these verses. But um, without the five, seven, nine, paragraph three, just the last verse of it, would that would seem to connect with me with 
verse 32. Yeah. That God had promised sort of good to them, but couldn't bring it to pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dealing with um, what we were talking about as far as, uh, well, there it talks about wealth, but we wouldn't, all that God had uh, was that was to be for Israel. So, I mean, one is they were to be a blessing to Israel so that this, in a sense, a curse comes upon Israel because of what happened with Eli and his sins. Now, if we try to, to apply this, uh, well, there's still lots lots of detail that we're, we're leaving out here. But Okay, so let's go back a little bit. So, I mean, we know we're going to run into the story of Hophni and Phinehas when they die. And I will raise me up a faithful priest. So this is going to be, let me see here. And we're going to say that these are, this is uh, going to be Zadok, right? So, I mean, the Sadducees, um, they're, they're actually, their names is that they're the sons of Zadok, right? Just through Greek and into English. So let me see here. Uh, I just want a verse that shows this. So we're, we're going to run into this in 2 Samuel. So maybe we'll just deal with that here. Sorry about this. Okay, so we're going to have Abiathar. He's going to be um, the fourth generation from Eli. But he's not a descendant of Eli. He's he, um, He's not a descendant of Eli. I think well, he it is. That none of none of Eli's house will. I believe uh, he's a descendant through Phinehas. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure he's a descendant. So, so what he's, so it's 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 not fulfilled until later, right? When Zadok is made, his line is made. Yeah, I'm just trying to find out uh, more about him. So it's going to be. Samuel taking over the priesthood after yes, Eli, and then after yeah. Samuel dies, it talks about Abimelech. Yeah, and he's going to be killed by Saul mm -hmm. or Doag, and then Abiathar is going to be a priest. Yeah, until he's replaced by Zadok by Solomon. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to find. Uh, yeah, so uh, Bithar was descended from Phinehas, the son of Eli, and, and through him from Ithamar, the son of Aaron, that was the son of Ahimelech, the head priest at Nob, who with his associates was put to death by King Saul. Just reading here in uh, a Bible dictionary. Right, so. so he would be descended from Echabod or... Another no, son? from Phinehas. He's a descendant of Phinehas. So he would be like a brother of Ichabod? Well, he's... Um, okay. Ithamar was descended from Phinehas, but I'm not sure how far, whether he's directly descended or not. We'd have to look at some of these verses. Um, I can look at First Samuel 4.19 and down, and then I don't know where you are exactly, Theodore. In Second Samuel. Um, in Second Samuel, you're saying it's in four nineteen. First uh, Samuel four nineteen. There was a son born, and I guess uh, Abiathar was great great grandson or whatever. Yeah, and his daughter-in-law Phinehas' wife was with child near to be delivered, and when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood by her said to her, unto her, right? And and so they named the child Ichabod. So Ichabod, would would that be the father of Abiathar? Well, I think it's Abimelech first. So, so, so Ichabod, Abimelech, and then Abiathar. Is that what you're saying? Possibly. Yeah, so I've, I've never looked into this before, so, right? So this is is sort of a I never dealt with this chronology or this genealogy before. 
I just knew about uh, Zadok replacing Abiathar at that line, but I never really thought of its connection to Eli uh, and to that prophecy. So it's something we will have to look at in, in more detail as we go through this. We'll run into it. So, so we got, okay, so we have um, Eli, then we have Vic, Ichabod, then we have, well, I guess Eli, Phinehas, Ichabod, Abimelech, and then Abiathar, right? That would be how we would, so once the prophecy is given, it's in the fourth generation that it moves to the sons of Zad Zadok, or it moves to Zadok. Is that how we would see it? I think we need to trace these lines uh, clearly. I know I sure haven't. Yeah. You have some uh, genealogy in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 3. Okay. Chapter 14. Okay. And Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest and child, wearing an ephod. And the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. Okay, so there's lots of background there. Okay, what I have is I found uh, one genealogy. They have a high tub is Ichabod's brother, and it's going to be through a high tub that we have Ahimelech, who's all, also called Ahia. And then we have Abath, Abath, Abathar, and then Abiathar, Abiathar. And then he has descendants, Ahimelech, also called Abimelech, and Jonathan are both descendants of his. And this one family tree diagram I have. It's not a very good one, though, to put on. Yeah, these are pretty hard to see. Bad colors and really thin and small. Let's see if I can just find a chart of this. Okay, so here's, here's one that's good. So just put this on for people to see. Okay, so this is, uh, they show the genealogy of the priests in David's time. So you got Aaron there. I'll make this bigger. Uh, Eleazar, Ithamar, right? Uh, Phinehas. Uh, that's a different Phinehas. Going down in this line, this is going to be where Zadok is going to be involved. It shows this as the seventh generation. And then on this side, Ithamar's descendants. So you're going to have Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas. Phinehas is going to have a high tub and Ichabod, and then Ahijah and Ahimelech, also called Abimelech, descendants of Ahitub, tub, and then Abiathar, and then Jonathan. Okay, does that make sense? Now I'm not so so obviously. Um, uh, you know, a high tub is older than Ichabod. Now, it's going to be Ichabod's descendants that are going to be cut out of the priesthood then and are going to be in penury, right? That would be the case. That makes sense, Stephen? Well, they're still, they still have relations which are involved in the priesthood. Mm -hmm. Possibly. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be a high tub's descendants because they're they're going to end up being high priests. So it'd have to be Ichabod's descendants. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, this is the first time I really looked at this in any kind of detail. I mean, just obviously I, I, I studied it one time. I mean, I've looked at it one time, but not not uh, not that it, I retained any of it. it. Wasn't really relevant at the time. So, so what we see then here is we have uh, from Eli, we have Phinehas, Ahitub, uh, Ahimelech, and then it's in the time of Abiathar. So we have four generations from Eli that then Zadok is going to, his line is going to be made the high priestly line. And, and we get the sons of Zadok, right, which become the Sadducees, and they just list some of them here, so different generations. So the, so te technically, I guess they're going back all the way from Ithamar, Eli, Ichabod, um, so that would be 
just wondering what these numbers, I think those are just, those aren't generations. Those little numbers there are just are referring to footnotes, I think. Yeah, they're referring to some kind of footnote. Okay, that's why. <clears throat> I was trying to figure out what that is. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to some of this tomorrow. I'll try to take a look at it uh, before we come back to this tomorrow. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? And, and we're going to need uh, chapter three, I guess, to look at because we're, we're basically done chapter two, at least in our first pass. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for this study and the time we had this morning and how little we know about things in your word and that we are seeking to understand and, and find relevance for us today in, in their symbols. But we pray for each person that you can be with them today. May you watch over them, take care of our loved ones, and help us as we uh, continue to search the scriptures and to obey your voice. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.